I am very glad that Dr. Erin White has come to speak to us and she is going to speak about David Jones, Sangan and the priests who turned their backs and she's a reader in Welsh history in Aberystwyth University um, focusing on the early modern period with a special interest in religion, culture and society. She's published a lot about the 18th century Wales and also looked more widely at um, aspects of the print culture in Wales and early non-conformity and uh, 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 keeping an eye on the uh, effect of education and religion on the women's lives and uh, she edits Caractigian, the History Society of Caractigian, so periodical and uh, 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 is is studies in uh, Welsh history and uh, uh, thank you Erin for giving up your Saturday morning to share with us and we'll uh, hand over to you now thank you very much well thank you very much man and, and thank you all for the invitation and the welcome this is where things uh, get a bit scary as I try to share my screen I'm not as familiar with Zoom as with Teams, but can you see that? Oh, oh yes, 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 it started now. So great. Okay, so that's worked. Everything is less of a problem to me now. It's the technology that uh, scares me. Now I was uh, asked to speak on this particular subject, so we're going to be talking about the ordination in Italy and the Methodist ways leave, leaving the uh, uh, Anglican Church. Now, I I was asked to speak on this particular subject. So, uh, this term, the priests who turned their backs, it's actually a quote from uh, uh, history of the 19th century Methodists and uh, the question of who uh, stayed and who turned their backs it's, of course it depends if you're looking from the Anglican side or the Methodist side so if you stand with one uh, the other people seem to turn their backs so it depends on your perspective and normally the history of 1811 and the decisions made by the supporters of Methodism is actually uh, related from the Methodist side, often of Thomas Charles and Tom, Thomas Jones of MB. And uh, people tend to take it for granted that because it happened that way, that it was inevitable somehow and that the separation from the church was going to happen sooner or later anyway. And uh, actually, um, when we think about the Protestants leaving the Catholic Church, that's, it was something that had to happen. But the truth is that very few historical developments are completely unavoidable. They are uh, affected by uh, details and factors on the way which contain the flow of history. You don't have to, you just have to listen to the news last week and see how things change and how you never know what will happen in the end. So we tend to think sometimes that's how it happened, that was inevitable, but no. But of course we are considering here in the title and uh, in the portrait there we're considering David Jones Langan and uh, he was against the separation and forming a new denomination but he died in 1810 before he had to face the final choice of staying with the church or going with the Methodists. So you can see there on the PowerPoint that uh, long uh, uh, career he had in the church and uh, he is there in his preaching bands, Geneva bands, which was a sign of the fact that he was ordained into the church. During the period in Wiltshire in England, uh, he was affected by the evangelical revival, not in his early days in Wales. And... Uh, because of um, 
his connection with uh, evangelical movements in Wales that he was uh, invited to Cairngan in Glamorgan through a friend of uh, the Countess of Huntington uh, in England. Uh, that's how he became uh, the vicar of Langan and uh, was connected with that parish for the rest of his life. In terms of the relationship between the Methodist and the church, there, were, there was a stream who wanted to separate from the start and uh, some of the uh, lay preachers uh, felt uh, very frustrated that they couldn't do anything other than uh, preach and look after the societies. They could not um, uh, preside at the sacraments and they felt that their ministry was limited and uh, it w wasn't a shock that uh, uh, some of these uh, joined the uh, um, uh, non-conformists quite early on, people like John Thomas of Freyder and uh, um, uh, 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 John Roberts in uh, the the Methodist in Methodist of Wales, nineteen thirty one, that he said that the Methodists were church people. Quite strange, and because it has to be said, they, they would break the uh, rules of the uh, um, church quite happily. But uh, uh, among uh, some and some of the main leaders uh, were priests Daniel Rowland, William Williams, Will Davis, and Peter Williams. It's worth remembering that uh, Rowland and uh, uh, the Williamses um, actually brought up sons who went into the church, and Daniel Rowland's son um, was actually uh, thrown out of the Methodists. I think one of the uh, 19th century historians said that it wasn't because of his sopriety or temperance. <laughs> so uh, uh, Nathaniel had uh, uh, a lack of sobriety problem. Um, he'd have been thrown out before 1811. But when uh, ever the um, uh, subject of uh, ordaining uh, within the, 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 the sessions, um, there were some, the leaders were very uh, keen uh, to stay in the Anglican Church. And uh, those who were ordained um, uh, were listed first in the um, records of the the, uh, the meetings all the time uh, because of the uh, tensions increasing between Methodism and nonconformity the minister nonconformist ministers uh, were less present in Methodism as time went on so but at least it shows there was an acceptance of ordination which was outside of the church that the leaders thought that there were good reasons to stay. Uh, so, in the first place, they said there was no theological reason to leave because the Methodists were quite happy with the articles of the Church of England and uh, Denzel Morgan's latest volume uh, confirms that. Also by 1811, the Methodists had, had been a kind of church within the church for about 70 years. And people argued, well, if it's worked so far, why change it? In English, says they, they say if it ain't broke, why fix it? That was the idea there. Even though I can't uh, imagine uh, uh, David Jones Langan saying that, but he would agree with the idea. So there was a, a, a fear of uh, breaking away as well. The new denomination might not be a success. They that they felt the members would uh, uh, be happy to join a new denomination, but would that continue? So there was a common sense reason to carry on as they were. Also, for the ordained uh, uh, clergy, they would be leaving, leaving uh, uh, a, a, a job uh, and... Uh, uh, earning a living was uh, consideration, not the main consideration uh, for most of them. 
because it was matters of principles in the end that would win through. But moving from uh, being a clergyman in a living was a big step. Uh, uh, it was easier for those priests who had no uh, uh, parish and uh, uh, many of those people who did not have a parish were ones who stayed with the movement in 1811. But Jerry Jones as well. The experience of working with uh, the Countess of Huntington might have influenced him. Selina Hastings, the uh, Countess of Huntington, was one of the most wealthy supporters of Calvinistic Methodisms in, way, in England. Uh, the Wesleyans were the larger group, of course. And on the Calvinist side, in uh, uh, England, uh, the fact that George Whitfield spent most of his time in America and that they didn't have a really good structure meant that uh, the movement suffered compared to the Wesleyans. But uh, Countess of Huntington had uh, formed a connection in 1783 that uh, the um, Anglican clergyman uh, wouldn't serve in her chapel, so she had to depend a lot on the Calvinistic Methodists in Wales, and she had a college in Tribeca and uh, close connections personally with David Jones because he had been involved in the movement in England. So he demanded a lot on uh, uh, David Jones um, and uh, the Welsh uh, Methodists to serve uh, in uh, uh, the chapels in England as well as the couples she had in Wales. And that had showed David Jones how difficult it had been to keep the movement going in England. And maybe that he feared that a separate uh, denomination in Wales might have similar problems and would suffer uh, in the same way. Uh, in, in the end, things came to a head in 1810 when um, it was brought up at the general session because the northern Welsh situation was very difficult. Well, things had almost broken in North Wales because they had only three ordained clergymen in the movement in North Wales, Thomas Charles, Simon Lloyd in Ballard, and William Lloyd in Carnarvon. And uh, there was a great demand for them as preachers and to baptise and to preside at communion. And uh, the society members uh, weren't keen uh, to turn to other clergymen uh, for the sacrament. So these three men had to serve them. There were more clergymen in the south, but uh, the numbers were uh, uh, quite low uh, to serve so many members. And then it increased, increased the power of the lay councillors in the uh, uh, the meetings uh, and in the general uh, session. And uh, by 1810, there were many people who were technically members of the church, but whose only experience of the church was the Methodist societies, and that's where their spiritual life was. So the idea that they would have to turn to the parish church to baptize their children seemed strange indeed. Because the church was an established church and uh, she had the advantage uh, for a long time in terms of uh, uh, burials, uh, marriages and uh, baptism. And uh, often to the members of societies, the local clergymen uh, were strangers. So it was difficult to go to them for baptism, for example. And it was similarly true about nonconformist ministers on the other side. So the uh, Edwin Hesemoser and uh, the session was asked by the Pensaren uh, Society in Cardiganshire. Well, I can't our our uh, uh, preachers um, uh, who are so powerful in the ministry to uh, uh, preside at the sacraments. But so, uh, but although some clergymen objected, uh, um, the members were listening to that uh, 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 argument. And Thomas Jones Denby had already started baptising children. Uh, uh, 
uh, and Johnny Evans uh, in, uh, in, in command and so had been baptising even before Thomas Jones. So the door had been opened and it was very difficult to uh, close. And that may be actually influenced Thomas Charles to uh, move towards ordination. So by the time Damon Jones sang and died on the 10th of August 1810, and even though um, there was, uh, 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 he was greatly missed, it actually made it easier for the separatists. It's quite clear from the minutes that we have from the southern uh, 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 session, uh, because there was one by then in north and the south. In the south, it was obvious that people were careful because of their respect to David Jones. They didn't want to press too much for separation with him there. And Thomas Jones then he said that the idea that it caused a uh, uh, pain, trouble, uh, to, uh, 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 that it caused pain to Thomas Charles in the north when he pressed separation and ordaining. And the same was true with David Jones in the south. So maybe uh, his death uh, uh, opened the door further to um, uh, 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 separation. Of course, uh, another clergyman had been lost in him. And uh, as the older people um, left the scene, it made it easier to uh, cut the links with the church. It wasn't um, just uh, young people who wanted to separate. John Evans had been there since the 1840s uh, and uh, believed he was too old to be ordained by St. Lamb, but he was very supportive of that move and he was the elder statement of the movement and the main connection with the early revival. But many of uh, the young people found it easier to think of separating. It was much more difficult for David Jones, who had been in the Holy Orders by, for over a century by 1810. So the addition was made in the, the summer uh, to move to ordination in, in the summer of 1811, and uh, in the northern session in uh, uh, Bala in 1920, June 1811, and this is a list of the first uh, people to be ordained, some very well-known people, John Elias in Anismon and Thomas Jones in Denby. And this sort of that, Robert Ellis uh, from Flintshire had been actually been ordained by the um, uh, Countess of Huntington's connection, was recognised, although he was already ordained. Now, one was a, it suggested that one, the reason Thomas Charles was um, very unsure of going out to ordination was didn't want to know what the process would be. But eventually, uh, without too much difficulty, they put a liturgy together and uh, John Evans of Bala, who represented the tradition of uh, uh, the movement, who read and prayed at the beginning, and Thomas Charles inquired the candidates about uh, uh, things like the Trinity and other doctrines, and asked him where they committed to the work of uh, the uh, connection. And then the representatives of various areas were asked to raise their hands, and then were ordained by the session itself, not by a particular church like uh, many of the nonconformists did, but they were in, uh, ordained by the session. And then uh, Robert Jones of Roslan prayed and gave a word of counsel and one of the great uh, leaders in the north. So no communion, no laying of an of hands, no uh, attempt to recreate the ordination service of the church. That's an amazingly historical event. And then uh, the uh, uh, southern session in St. Elon uh, followed suit on the 10th and 11th of July and they ordained, uh, they went to uh, superstitions, they ordained 13. So some uh, well-known names there, David Charles, uh, uh, 
John Evans, uh, who had already been baptizing uh, children. So, Ebenezer Moses, Ebenezer Richard of uh, Cardiganshire, uh, who became one of the leaders in the 19th century. And most of these were uh, experienced middle-aged men. They uh, seemed uh, completely suitable to be ordained as ministers. And, of course, there were no women among them at in this time. We were speaking of middle-aged men for the most part. Um, one of those in the north was the youngest, at 33, 34. But uh, they had uh, uh, actually uh, chosen safe pairs of hands uh, uh, for the first ordination. So the hope was to uh, ordain at Llangeitho in the south because of the connection with Daniel Rowland. But the local Methodists uh, um, weren't happy for that. Um, probably uh, that was uh, um, uh, a heritage of Rowland's views of staying in the church. Yeah. Don Thomas Fletcher and John Williams Pantacalin, uh, who were uh, church clergy, were actually uh, involved in the ordination in the south, um, taking uh, uh, the roles of John Evans and Robert Jones in the north. But it was in the south as well um, uh, that most uh, clergy were lost to the movement as well. Uh, it was easy in the north, there were only three clergy and they were all in favour of uh, ordination. And uh, here's a list of those who turned their back on Methodism and uh, uh, borrowing uh, 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 from uh, uh, the Methodist commentaries on this. It's difficult to find a full list. Um, various names appear. But in terms of those who uh, turned their backs, there were losses in Pembrokeshire. Pembrokeshire was uh, very uh, 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 fortunate uh, with uh, four uh, Methodist clergy, and David John Langan has spent a lot of time there. He'd married his second wife from Manor Owen, so we see David David Langvernach, who has been brought up on the Methodist hearth. And uh, the society was held on at its home in Newcastle and Lynn and in George and um, uh, St. Dockmiles and, uh, and uh, David Griffiths and never. And uh, probably it was because of David Griffiths influence that so many uh, in Pembrokeshire um, turned their backs. There were also others among the uh, uh, clergy who had been friendly towards Methodism, who uh, uh, distanced themselves then, like David Abbott, Llandon, Cardiganshire. They broke the connections, more or less, after 1811, and Cretan was very strongly against. So there was quite a reaction among uh, Anglican clergy. In terms of those who stayed, uh, most of these had their own living. It was easier for them to support, continue supporting. I, Thomas Charles, Simon Lloyd, uh, William Lloyd, had that have uh, didn't have a uh, um, uh, parish, and uh, John William Sletrod and uh, John William Plantagelin were similar. So how well, how else? Trey Hill, he. Uh, con- for a while, he was able to continue to serve uh, as a clergyman and also uh, uh, visiting the uh, uh, Methodist chapels regularly. But uh, eventually, um, the bishop of St. Asaf told him that he had to either leave the Methodist or leave the church. And uh, he left uh, quite quietly in 1818 and you can see why a bishop would find it strange that one of his uh, priests was dallying with uh, non-conformists and one who Ben Richard Blassett in Tathan though uh, was able to remain in the church and with the Methodists he was curator of St. 
as sun, and then he became a, a rectal victor elsewhere about in 1852 and he was really the last of the, the Methodist clergy who uh, had uh, maintained a fort in both camps. That was an advantage in terms of Glamorgan. Um, uh, yeah. um, so, um, uh, one of these people was uh, um, a trustee of several chapels and it helped that he was able to stay in the church. And uh, one of the complications that occurred was that often when chapels were um, uh, uh, founded, uh, often the clergyman, local clergyman, was uh, one of the trustees. And when some of those clergy left, it led to the closure of the chapel, such as in Nevern and in St. Dogmills. And uh, that caused ill feeling because it was the members who paid for uh, building those chapels. But the churches said uh, that uh, these chapels had been built by people who were members of the church. And if they left the church, they forfeited the rights to use them. I mean, an attempt to uh, 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 um, repossess the Eglisuru uh, um, Chapel. Uh, but uh, it was replied that uh, the uh, early Methodists had broken the ninth canon of the church and uh, had uh, bro- left the church before they uh, uh, built the chapels. And the Methodists used this. I don't know if you know the ninth canon, but this is a canon which says that uh, uh, if you uh, formed a fellowship outside the church, you were to be excommunicated. But the, the Toleration Act in 1689 had allowed uh, the establishment of uh, uh, congregations outside the church. So the canon was irrelevant after that, that somebody had been looking through canon law in the hope of making use of the ninth canon. Uh, but uh, that was in vain in the end. The uh, uh, key uh, uh, was in the vicar's hand, and that's where the key to the chapel remained. But it's fair to say that uh, the, um, David Griffiths Nevin wasn't well remembered by the Methodists in the 19th century, but uh, uh, this photo of him is in, uh, picture of him is in uh, a Methodist publication. But uh, he uh, was one of the uh, trustees of the Madame Devon's Foundation uh, and did a lot of education work and he was a very effective preacher, it is said. But uh, as I read one of his last letters that he wrote to his sister on the 29th of March, 1834, I was uh, uh, struck by the uh, <coughs> echo of some of the last letters of William Williams and Thomas Charles, because he says he is uh, housebound and for four months has not been able to go to Nevern Church, and he was without the only pleasure he's had in, in his world. He'd been preaching for 54 years, but now felt worthless, only hoping to be released from this body of sin through the love of God. And uh, uh, you may remember that Svante Kellen had uh, travelled enough during his life to go around the world four times. But in his last days, he was just could just move from the fire to the bed. And there's a feeling of uh, uh, frustration for both um, of Griffiths and Williams. And both of them died as ministers in the Church of England and believed that's what they should have been but the frustration of not being able to carry out uh, their calling. And uh, there was a similar frustration among those who uh, were uh, uh, campaigning for um, ordination uh, so they could fully uh, act, um, act out of the ministry. So was separation um, uh, an inevitable well, no, but uh, uh, it was on uh, uh, the horizon. So, 
Uh, well, I ever talked about the ninth canon, uh, they bring up an important point uh, that they were acting as a domination from the 1740s. They collected many subscriptions from their uh, societies and uh, and they were already building chapels by the end of the 1740s. And the literature of Methodists had uh, uh, also furthered this sense of um, uh, 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 separation from April 1779. Um, uh, 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 the uh, all, uh, their, uh, um, uh, uh, the the Methodist periodical was also building up this feeling of belonging together among the various congregations, and. Uh, uh, was the first denominational publication by movement which wasn't officially domination. So it is difficult to see how things could continue and uh, to understand how the church had accepted the situation so long. But because of uh, the uh, turnover in bishops, um, there was uh, an inconsistent approach. Uh, sometimes people were summoned to court for uh, holding um, uh, uh, services in the houses or press ganging some uh, uh, lay preachers. Although, uh, although uh, Howell Harris was a member of the militia, um, uh, these preachers were probably not very good uh, soldiers. So, uh, and John Owen, the Chancellor of Bangor, for example, was uh, uh, much uh, more uh, um, uh, uh, unhappy with the Methodists. And, uh, and uh, 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 people like Thomas Charles uh, um, uh, were unable to find uh, parishes because he was so well known um, uh, as a Methodist, as they have to uh, marrying Sally in the Bella. But the, uh, obviously, the Methodist preachers were breaking the church rules, and it was quite clear that church officials, some church officials were very much opposed to that. So it is surprising that things carried on so uh, long. It's interesting that William Cleaver, Bishop of St. Asaph and Thomas Burgess of St. David's, soon after the separation, had uh, 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 ordained uh, uh, evangelically minded young men. So maybe they were seeing, uh, they were responding to the challenge of Methodism, but also strengthened the evangelical group within the Church of England, because that wasn't the end of uh, the Church's connection with the uh, evangelical revival. Because that was at the end of the connection between the church and the evangelical revival. I've spoken about some of the leading figures in Methodism in the church, but uh, the influence was much wider than that. Um, the uh, evangelical uh, element in England was more obvious in England, but also in Wales. Roger Brown, for example, has uh, looked at the history of the continuing evangelical movement within the church uh, here in Wales. And uh, that uh, needs uh, more research, I think, and maybe that could be another session for Gomelin uh, Gwynllan in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Erdin. That was a, a great presentation. Uh, just make... I think uh, how influential one person can be and you've raised a uh, lot of questions about uh, what is happening today uh, and influencing us today so it's opportunity now for you to ask a question we have had uh, one uh, uh, comment by uh, uh, Ian Thomas about uh, that he was born uh, 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 John Wesley saying he was born an Anglican and uh, was saying that. If you want to ask a question, can you raise your hand uh, uh, virtually, please, or put it in the chat? We have a few minutes for questions. 
That uh, quote by John Wesley says a lot about the attitude of that first generation of leaders in uh, England and in Wales. Uh, we see the same response by Daniel Rowlands. They felt that the church was their place and they believed that the church would uh, reform itself. So uh, a lot of the, of the choice uh, about leaving uh, comes because of practical reasons, not because of uh, uh, a doctrine, for example. And Will Harris said that uh, uh, said uh, he couldn't agree with the um, uh, non-conformists in general in terms of church structure. So uh, uh, throughout the 18th century, we have that debate among the Methodists. What would have happened if he'd uh, lived, do you think? Well, I don't... Th I think it would have been very difficult for David George Langan to leave the church. The, uh, so, some of the uh, uh, Methodist uh, historians of the 19th century uh, say that uh, he was uh, a Methodist to the end, that he would have left. But he had been for over 50 years a minister in the Church of England. I don't think he would have turned his back. I think it would have been very difficult and it would be... Uh, it would be very difficult to make that decision. Uh, Thomas Charles was against separation until the very last minute, and then uh, at he he uh, I think he was pressurised by, for instance, Thomas Jones's uh, um, decision to uh, uh, baptise, and uh, the southern uh, session would have been found it very difficult, I think, uh, um, uh, with David Jones. One thing that struck me uh, as Serin was speaking, and I don't know very much about the Methodists in England, I saw an irony in the fact that the Welsh Methodists were so structured compared to the Calvinistic Methodists in England, so that uh, the result of uh, that structure, even though Harris and Rowland were so uh, loyal to the church, the fact that they had that organisation um, actually uh, pushed them uh, to uh, leave, whereas in England there was a lack of organisation among the uh, Calvinistic Methodists in England. Uh, that meant uh, that uh, there was a strong evangelical wing uh, in England within the church in the 19th century compared to Wales as a uh, uh, although the uh, evangelical side was important in Wales, as you said, yes, I think the uh, structure was important. The Wesleyan Methodists were the organised ones in England and the Calvinistic ones in Wales. Um, so they had uh, learned uh, from the church to have some kind of hierarchy, some kind of... Uh, 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 local structure at least. You had societies reporting to uh, uh, the assembly. So, <coughs> uh, so that things were much less organised among the Calvinistic Methodists in England. And that's why we see them uh, uh, deteriorating so much during the period. <coughs> to note one other thing. During a period leading to the formal separation, it's important to remember that it was a time of uh, war with France. So um, militias were used against the uh, Methodist preachers, which forced them uh, to uh, become uh, to license their ministers and their uh, chapels. So they were forced, in a way by people, by Colbert uh, in uh, Tewin, for example, to start on the formal process of uh, registering as nonconformists. That's another factor in the north more than the south, I think, yes. There's a question from me, uh, uh, come to me from Howell. Howell, do you want to ask it to everybody? Can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you, Howell. 
Uh, taking that uh, the uh, uh, departure of the Methodists wasn't inevitable, what <coughs> would have been the result of them remaining in the Church, um, the spirituality and the Welshers of the Church? Well, how much time do we have this morning? That's a big question. It's difficult to say because they were actually separating themselves within the church already. So it's difficult to think how much they could contribute to the life of the church. But still, even after the ordination, there were some cooperation already. Uh, the Methodist uh, uh, historians tend to say that was it, you know, that uh, they would nobody talk to each other anymore. But certainly locally, uh, uh, there was still cooperation. But, uh, uh, I don't actually spend uh, too much time usually looking at religion in the 19th century, but that would be a very interesting question uh, uh, for uh, uh, Denzel, for example, to look at. Thank you, Erin, for your uh, uh, wonderful paper. Just a, a footnote to the words that have been said already. Uh, what if... You know, sometimes people want uh, historians to be uh, prophets. It doesn't work like that. But what struck me, there is a quote by John Williams, the son of uh, Pantacalli to his brother, it's great that all the, all of these are gone on the other side of the Ganges. We don't uh, want anything to do with them. That was the voice of the younger generation. Well, think of the uh, the sons, uh, uh, Peter Williams, Ebenezer, of the vicar of Lampeter, who was evangelical but not a Methodist. Although he was a son of the Methodist, he, he wasn't part of the movement, but he was very evangelical, and they were responsible for reviving the evangelical uh, uh, side in the church, including well, uh, those uh, uh, new priests who had been on day in 1811 by the bishops like John Dews at Beristwith, they were very evangelical, but they weren't Methodists at all. So that's part of the story as well. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But thank you very much, Dr. Erin, for a very uh, um, interesting uh, 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 presentation and made us think not just uh, about that period, but our uh, time as well. Thank you very much. Well, we're looking forward for our uh, second uh, um, address. Uh, we've uh, often had uh, people working in uh, Welsh and uh, uh, literature uh, uh, as well as religion. Um, John Aaron comes from the physics uh, discipline here. He has uh, made studies of uh, laser uh, physics in Nancy uh, University and he's been a, a physics teacher in several uh, schools, including Estelle Vera, and uh, he... Uh, was became school manager at the end in my He uh, retired in 2013 and he's uh, um, married with two uh, children and six uh, um, grandchildren. And uh, he's remembered for a Venetian chaplain in 24 or 50 years. And uh, he has written extensively on church history in Wales. And he's going to do, discuss Thomas Charles and Thomas Jones with me now. You have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the welcome, for the invitation to join you. And uh, thanks to Erin, especially, for... Um, her uh, lecture. We're going to look at the lives of Thomas Charles and Thomas Jones Creighton and uh, 
in her uh, uh, presentation has given uh, the, the background very thoroughly and clearly, which will be a great help for me as I look at their lives. And uh, the uh, uh, relationship between the Church of England and the Nonconformity has been uh, uh, part of uh, the world situation since the, the Reformation. It's been a very complex uh, uh, relationship, but uh, it's therefore very interesting uh, that the uh, Church of England defines the second of course. The nonconformists were the people who uh, refused uh, the Anglican system and uh, the activities of uh, both sides affected each other uh, th through uh, the period since the uh, Protestant Reformation and has been an important factor at particular times in our history. We think of uh, the Civil War period, the Puritan period in Wales, the uh, Methodist revival time, and and uh, 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 into uh, the nineteenth century, um, tie the war, etc. And uh, that uh, relationship has divined the lives of uh, many individuals as well, and no one uh, more than Thomas Charles of Bala and Thomas Charles of Creton. Um, one well known to us, perhaps the other not so well known. They were uh, both churchmen uh, uh, by principle. Uh, we need to uh, emphasize that at the beginning, uh, that as they were both Methodists, so they uh, rejoiced in the uh, uh, Methodist revival that had been going on for 50 years. They supported the leaders and uh, they were uh, usually church uh, people like Daniel Rowlands and David Jones, Langan, and uh, Thomas Charles and Thomas Jones were friends and uh, colleagues and they were very similar in view throughout their years, almost all their lives. Because in the last three years of Thomas Charles' life, um, their friendship came to an end and Thomas Charles died. When Thomas Charles died, they were belonged to two different denominations. You could argue that this division between them wouldn't have happened apart uh, from the uh, the providential uh, fact that one of them fell in love with a particular woman. And I will to give you a very uh, brief resume of their lives. Thomas Jones Creton, uh, starting with him just because he was the elder one, 1852 to 1845. That's, uh, he was elder by about three years. His life is a pattern of something that happened to many uh, uh, Welsh evangelical clergymen in that he had to leave Wales and take up a post in England, um, often because uh, the Welsh bishops wouldn't appoint Methodists to parishes or because um, some people uh, uh, who were in parishes were rejected by their congregations because of their Methodist preaching. Uh, he was born in Thomas in Havod, Clumestwith, in Cardinalshire, and uh, educated under Edward Richard uh, in his famous school in the Stradmeirig. He was uh, curate in Cardinalshire to start with, and then went uh, had to go to uh, England to work. He was uh, a curate in Loppington, about ten miles east of Oswestry Street, one time, and there. It was he met Thomas Charles for the first time. Then he went to a place called Great Greeton in Northamptonshire in 1785, and he was a curate there for 43 years, and then a rector uh, for another five years. And uh, he 
He was 92 when he died in 1745 and he survived Thomas Charles by quite a stretch. And Charles and he would uh, correspond often and he wrote to his friend in 1785 and writing in English as they did. Uh, as, uh, just as we appointed to Cretan. And then another letter, uh, three years later. Ever since I've been ordained, I've been exceedingly desirous of settling in North Wales, but my way is hedged up, nor do I see the least probability that my wishes shall ever be gratified, yet I cannot banish all the hopes. Danny Brigethi, Nerthor, I've been led to another region of Hedra, an invo, and uh, his uh, powerful preaching, <coughs> uh, um, his evangelical preaching, his congregation grew amazingly. He established a uh, uh, Sunday school in Cretan uh, according to uh, 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 Charles's pattern. That was before the Bible Society uh, existed. Uh, he was uh, uh, campaigning for more Wells and Gwent Bibles in 1799 with the help of William Wilberforce to persuade um, uh, the SPCK to publish uh, a new edition of 10,000 Welsh Bibles. And William Wilberforce was on the SPCK committee and uh, he helped to put this uh, request through. But, uh, such was the demand of Bibles in Wales because of the evangelical revival. The 10,000 copies disappeared within a year. And uh, he worked uh, uh, um, uh, 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 to establish uh, the Bible Society uh, and he got his same books in uh, 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 Welsh, mostly translations uh, of the Puritan works, including uh, work by Richard Baxter, and he probably 17 uh, books in English. If you find in some uh, uh, second-hand bookshop a, a book called Baskets of Fragments, it's worth buying, it's worth reading. Its pages are uh, full of clear evidence of uh, his uh, warm-hearted uh, evangelical preaching as an old man, full of Christ and full of sustenance and uh, uh, hope for the saints. So that's a quick look at uh, Thomas Charles's uh, life. Tom and Charles Charles, we obviously it's more well known to us. Seventeen fifty five to eighteen fourteen, born in Longmore uh, uh, farmhouse near to St Clair's in Carmarthenshire, and uh, when he was uh, a student at the Garden Academy, he was converted as he listened to Daniel Rowlands, and his. Uh, uh, description in his uh, diary is worth uh, us reading again. A day much to be remembered by me, as long as I live, I had such a view of Christ as our high priest, of his love, compassion, power, as all sufficiency, <coughs> as filled my soul with astonishment, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. My mind was overwhelmed and overpowered with amazement. The truths accepted to my view appeared too wonderfully gracious to be believed. I could not believe for very joy. The glorious scenes that then opened to my eyes will abundantly satisfy my soul millions of years hence in the contemplation of them. He went to Jesus College, Oxford, and spent uh, one summer holiday in 1777 in the home of the hymn writer John Newton, helping him in his church in Olney, Buckinghamshire. Here's uh, Newton representing the strong evangelical wing in the Church of England that we talked heard about already. 
and an example of how they were uh, very aware of uh, the students in the universities who were of this, what, the same mind and would help them. And then after he uh, graduated, he became a curate in Somerset for almost five years. But in the meantime, he had uh, fallen in love with uh, uh, one of the members of the society, Mother Society in Bala, a woman called Sally Jones, who lived with her uh, mother and stepfather in Bala, and uh, who was uh, uh, involved in the shop uh, that uh, supported them as a family. During his time in the Somerset, Thomas Hart was looking for an opportunity to come back to Wales so he could marry Sally Jones and work as uh, a priest in Wales. Because Sally was unwilling to leave her parents, in the end, Charles moved to Bella. To ma- he failed to get a place uh, as a parish priest anywhere, that in the end, he decided. In the end, Charles moved to Bala, where he he hadn't uh, been able to be appointed to any parish. And in the end, he decided, uh, well, he might as well move to Bala to marry. And uh, he felt he would have uh, enough work there helping uh, other priests in the area. On four uh, occasions, he was... uh, 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 a minister uh, pro tem of uh, uh, churches like Clangadnock and Llandegla, but in the end, each time he was forced to leave because of the Methodist nature of his preaching. And when he left Llandegla, one of those churches in April 18, 1774, his uh, career as a priest uh, in the Church of England came to an end, although he didn't realise at the time. And uh, uh, he, but he had friends who were looking after him, and uh, he was offered several opportunities in England. But Sally wouldn't leave her parents, and he wouldn't want to leave Sally. He was offered several opportunities in England, but Sally uh, wouldn't leave her parents and he wouldn't leave Sally. And at the end, uh, on top of that, the he was becoming more and more aware of the great need of the societies in North Wales. We'd heard about this already, their need for ministry, for leadership uh, by now. There were almost a hundred societies in the north, and not at this time, not one Methodist uh, cl- a clergyman. It's only when a, a, a Methodist priest from the south who was passing through uh, could uh, uh, Holy Communion be offered, and at the end. After being uh, unemployed for a year and uh, Sally supporting him through the shop, Charles uh, took uh, the decision to join the Society, Methodist Society in Bella by 1784. By the middle of the next year, he had 2,000 people in his congregation as he preached in Bella. And uh, he became... Thomas Charles of Bala from then on. His greatness as a leader among the Methodists over 30 years is seen in three things. Firstly, his wisdom and uh, his understanding uh, of uh, what exactly is discernment of the true needs of the movement. Then, his, uh, his vision and uh, uh, his ability to decide on the right um, uh, practical solutions for the problems of uh, the movement. And thirdly, and uh, 
Oh, and there were the most amazing things about him. His patience, his consistency, his amazing energy to uh, um, put his vision uh, to work, uh, uh, to meet those needs. And it's amazing how he was able to do that in so many ways. Now, I'll list uh, the, uh, his main activities over the following years. Just uh, a brief view of uh, what he achieved. Uh, we know already about most of them, but it's uh, uh, right to uh, list them so that we have an idea of all the work he did for the Methodists. Firstly, he re-established um, circulating schools on Griffith Jones's pattern. Then he established and organised uh, Sunday schools. That's... Uh, uh, was uh, a life's work uh, in, in, uh, in terms of developing these into the 19th century, then leading the Methodists in the North, then after William Williams' death in 1791, leading the movement throughout the country in Wales. And fourthly, at the end of the evening service, on the first uh, Sunday of October 1791, a powerful revival broke out and there's ministry at the chapel in Bala. It spread uh, quickly through Carnarvonshire and, 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 and down uh, to, uh, through Cardinalshire and Pembrokeshire. The effects of uh, this uh, revival uh, in uh, some places continued through the next year and into 1793 and this uh, revival um, uh, across the establishment of, uh, across, um, uh, cemented um, uh, him as a leader and authority among the Methodists and he, uh, with Thomas Jones of Denby, established um, a result of a spiritual spiritual treasury, the first uh, Welsh religious periodical text. Uh, he was uh, the uh, main mover behind uh, the establishment of the British and Foreign Bible Society and uh, the story of Mary Jones comes there. Seventh, he wrote uh, the uh, his famous catechism, her father Charles, Charles's instructor. The uh, uh, it's it was the instructor, but it's called her father Charles by everybody, and that uh, after working for twenty years with children and citing catechisms for the Sunday school, eighty editions of uh, uh, the instructor during the 19th century and uh, uh, that, uh, each one including tens of thousands of copies so hundreds of thousands of copies were um, produced altogether in the 19th century eighth uh, the uh, 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 work of editing new editions of the Welsh Bible uh, for the Bible Society twice in 1807 and 1814. Then his uh, magnum opus, the uh, the uh, uh, Gerardus the scriptural dictionary called Gerardus Charles by everybody, 10 years of work, including 5,600 references and over a million words. The article on the one word, Kavamod Covenant, includes over 6,500 words. But it's important, as we look at uh, all these contributions in his life, we have to remember what his uh, priority was. And the greatest, uh, most important thing for Thomas Charles was his work as an evangelist and a travelling preacher for the Methodists. So on any uh, Sunday, except, except the Sundays he'd be preaching in Bala, and uh, uh, his uh, uh, some periods of sickness, every Sunday he would be on his horse somewhere in North Wales, or on a journey through the south, or in England, on the, 
on its way to some house or a, 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 a barn or chapel to uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preaching was his priority throughout his age, uh, life. And then in 1811, and uh, the path uh, towards that date, we've heard clearly about it from uh, Erin. And this is where uh, uh, a big change came in his relationship with Thomas Jones Creighton, the ordination of 1811. As I said, uh, Charles was a convinced Anglican, even though he had been uh, uh, banned from preaching within the churches. He cons- uh, he did preach, by the way, in uh, some uh, churches in England uh, when he went there, but not in Wales. That it been, uh, he, yet he considered himself an Anglican priest, and we've heard uh, one uh, 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 the, the thing about John Wesley uh, already. Uh, uh, so, uh, this is how somebody described John Wesley that throughout uh, uh, his uh, career he faced one way but uh, rode consistently in another direction. And that's a great description of Thomas Charles as well. The, uh, the, uh, organ- his organisation of... Uh, that, uh, that when talked about earlier, uh, the uh, uh, st- strong uh, organisation of the connection moved... Uh, the body within the church towards the form of an independent denomination. And in the end, as we've heard, he was uh, finally um, uh, persuaded that they would have to, as a body, ordain their own ministers. That's the only way to uh, uh, meet the needs of the societies um, that their own elders uh, could actually... um, uh, uh, offer the sacraments among them. Thomas Charles could see that if he didn't help in this campaign, that the Methodists would be divided. Some uh, would uh, become uh, uh, independent nonconformists. Uh, it would divide into various uh, uh, parties. And uh, Methodism for the future would be much weaker than it could have been. But if he organised and led and uh, uh, and the timetabled things, it, they could possibly leave as a strong body and continue their work. And that was what was agreed. Uh, uh, and uh, the ordination happened in 1811, in the north, Llandela in the south. And... Uh, Really, that was when the uh, Methodist, uh, Calvinistic Methodist Church of Wales was established. And that was also uh, why the friendship with Thomas Charles and Thomas Jones Creighton came to an end. Thomas Jones uh, wrote a pamphlet of uh, uh, a powerful protest against the ordination. The Wales Looking Glass of Thought and State of Religion in the Wales. The the verse that he put on the, the front of the book show his uh, standpoint. It was from uh, Lamentations 4.16. The anger of the Lord hath divided them. It's... The uh, uh, Lord hath divided them. And in one way, looking at uh, the work of Thomas Jones over the years, it's a very sad thing that he is remembered often, uh, mainly because of this book. And he wrote one last letter to his old friend, and it's worth uh, reading some of that. Lo, the bright prospect was clouded 
in a day. Should you plead that you listen to the voice of the people? I answer no, but to the voice of the wicked spirits through a small part of the people. But the thing is done, it is not of God, it will not end well. Will you give my love to Mrs. Charles, for whose long afflictions I am truly concerned? The Lord bless you both, your old friend, Thomas Jones. I hate to greet them, but I think we will go ahead and all heavy of any man. And the truck that the way we are not in triste enough, Yr hyn a'i dweud allan rhan o ddiweddglo erthig o Thomas Charles yn y geriadur ar yr enw Iesu. Er mwyn i chi gael blas o gynnwys a garddull a annaws y geriadur. Er i fod yn byw mewn tlodi, hefreir oedd i ben i'r enw. And uh, as we know, there was no correspondence between them after that. But rather than ending on that sad note, I'll finish by reading part of uh, the conclusion of Thomas Charles's article in his d- dictionary on the name Jesus. So you can have a feel of uh, uh, the content and style of that volume. Though he lived in poverty, with no place to lay down his head, afflicted, without a comforter, persecuted, without a defender, yet he went about doing good to others, in every circumstance, without wearying or wakening. He had one object constantly before him, naming the glory of God and the good of mankind, We see power, but it is power to protect and not to terrify. Power moderated by tenderness, satisfying and comforting, while yet drawing forth reverent fear. Great gentleness is gathered together wonderfully in him. Every divine greatness and excellence, every human ability and gift, everything sacred and gracious meet together in his uh, in him uh, we see him having fellowship with prophets lawgivers and angels he reveals himself as omniscient probing and discerning the very depths of men's hearts he claims his, his uh, uh, right of the keys of death and hell he predicts his coming as judge on the last day with divine majesty and preeminence. Yet, he is also seen embracing little children, meek, gentle and humble. He will not lift his voice in the street, nor break the bruised reed, nor quench the smoking flax. Thus all his disciples, servants, but friends and brothers, tenderly and loving, in kindness and friendship. He heals the sick, has compassion upon those in trouble, and restores the backslidden. He is altogether lovely. It's not merciful Jesus. There has not been, there never will be your equal. And as I finish, it's worth noting that Bible Society intends to publish a new edition of uh, 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 Geriadur Charles and put it online soon. It is to be hoped there uh, will be much reading of it during our digital days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jack John Aaron, we have a, another a very interesting address, and this checks me just how uh, the people of past use their own technology, and we are trying to do our best with our technology. And we have two questions or comments in the chat. One by Ian Thomas, if you have a question, but he says it's uh, significant that 
the many are virtual chances works uh, called Anglican, the Catechism, the importance of uh, the sacraments and uh, um, uh, uh, formal ordination. Is there a question from that, Ian? Oh, just to note how interesting that is to our uh, ears. You have a response to that, John? Well, just that it's uh, completely true. And I think uh, from Erin's uh, lecture that shows why it was like that. We are talking about a movement within the Anglican Church. Um, for three quarters of a century, and these are, uh, uh, this is what you'd expect. And then that uh, very painful change on both sides as uh, the process developed of uh, forming a Calvinistic Methodist Church. And to add to, in addition to that, that Thomas Charles uh, didn't want any confession of faith for the Methodists because he was completely happy with the articles <coughs> of the Church of England as defining his faith. And that that question from Irene Edwards, could we talk about uh, the contribution of Evan Morgan? Can I answer that, uh, maybe, Manon? Edward Morgan is a, a, a down uh, for one of the future, uh, uh, future uh, with them. Uh, uh, he and uh, John Owen um, were uh, uh, Welsh uh, clergymen working over uh, uh, the border. So you probably wait up to wait till about a year for that session. Uh, I was going to try and speak. Uh, uh, we're full of uh, 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 full of information about Edward Morgan Sisson, but when James has saved me the trouble, and uh, then says quite a fan of John Owen Sissington as well. Can I thank uh, John for uh, that excellent paper, and uh, as he said, uh, spanning. The amazing contribution of uh, Charles, uh, one of the our uh, 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 and uh, I, and we don't know so much about Thomas Jones. So thank you for enlightening us. But I'd like to speak about another Thomas Jones, which is Thomas Jones from Denby, and he's not part of this story because uh, truth be told. That it wasn't. He wasn't so much in, uh, interested in the Anglican situation, even though his knowledge of a uh, of a Anglican uh, theology, uh, to use an anachronistic word, there was uh, the Dempsey knew a great deal about that, yeah, and uh, he. Uh, produced the uh, theological apologia for the um, uh, 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 separation. Um, uh, his problem was schism, uh, uh, breaking away from the body of the church. So uh, yeah, he wanted to see uh, the the Methodist spirit, spirit enlightened the whole church and uh, not uh, 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 that's what uh, Thomas Jones creeds in the thing but uh, um, Thomas Jones be, was pragmatically suspicious of the Church of England and because he knew uh, <coughs> the works of the Protestant reformers including us in England he said this was not a uh, schism the diff Definition of the church in Protestantism is where the sacraments are uh, uh, enacted and where there is the gospel is preaching. And we cannot give our people the sacraments. So it's not a schismatic uh, uh, matter of offering, being able to offer the sacraments. It's a Catholic uh, step. And I think that helped 
Charles. He didn't really solve his conscience, but he could see a theological rationale uh, to say we're not schismatic. The Methodists now have turned into a church, not a wing, but a church in their own right from having the sacraments as well as the word. But thank you, John, for enlightening us about those two men. I don't know if, John, if you've got a response to that, just uh, the amazement uh, with these three men, we see the full range of responses. There was John Creighton, who uh, was a third Anglican at the other end, uh, Thomas, uh, John Dembe, and uh, his standpoint, as we've heard just now, and then Thomas Charles in the centre. And uh, it's amazing that those three, with uh, all their abilities, lived in the same period and just was part of the complexity of this relationship we've been discussing. Thank you very much. Before we go to the uh, uh, vote of thanks, we have two more meetings this term. The eighth women are, um, we've had seven already. It will be on the Saturday morning as well, on the 19th of February, and we will be discussing John Robert Tremilchen, the Blue Brew Night, and, uh, 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 and we're talking about Peter Ben, really, uh, 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 when I've read the Dr. Mary Ann Constantine, and then the ninth seminar will be on the 26th of March. The former Bishop Wynn, Wynn Evans, on Thomas Burgess, Thomas Bainan, and uh, St. David's College. Uh, we're celebrating the anniversary of founding that the college. And then Dr. Phil Mayer Jones, discussing Ivan Kerry and Gwellden Mechnein. I'm going to ask Ruth uh, Willis uh, to. Uh, uh, give a vote of thanks. So thanks very much, Dr. N. White and Dr. John Aaron, for two very interesting lectures this morning. You filled uh, uh, big gaps in my knowledge and understanding of the period, and that in a very uh, 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 in- interesting way. Thanks for sharing your scholarship and your expertise, and that in such a clear and uh, uh, entertaining way as well. Thank you very much to both of us, both of you. So thank you Ruth. So if you want uh, an opportunity to ask your questions, you can uh, stay now for about half an hour. But if you can't uh, stay with us, thank you so much for coming to the meeting and I hope very much we'll uh, see you soon.